Hello, we're World Clinicians, and welcome to this Friday's question. This Friday's question comes to us from a viewer who asks, how can I improve my success rate? Well, the answer seems to be pretty straightforward when it comes to endodontics. The answer is to use a septic technique. So let's come back and take a quick look at that. Of all dental specialties, endodontic therapy is the one that comes closest to microbiology and control of microbes. Now, periodontal disease, of course, and periodontics is fairly close to it as well until, you know, most of the uh, periodontal colleagues have moved on to uh, basically place implants rather than treat periodontal disease. For the time being, however, endodontics still is concerned with saving teeth through microbial control. And in fact, if we apply Dr. Martin Trope's definition of endodontics being microbial control, and that progress is efficient control of the microbes, it becomes very clear that the main objective of our endodontic therapy is to primarily remove the microbial contamination that is present in the diseased pulp as well as a root canal space and prevent from additional infection of that space. Now, infection of that space during the endodontic therapy comes from the patient's own microbial sources, which includes the saliva as well as the patient's own breath. Of course, Afterwards, following endodontic therapy, adherence to a very good clinical coronal seal prevents recontamination of that space from saliva and the patient's breath. It's important to understand that the microbes that contaminate the root canal space are the same microbes that are present in the oral cavity. These are not some foreign um, alien microbes that are present. These are the very same microbes that are present in the patient's own mouth, except that they're, you know, if this same amount of uh, microbes were present under the skin or right in a little cut in the gingiva, it would heal nicely, but inside the root canal, because it's a low compliant environment, uh, the, uh, they create a little bit of a constant type of an inflammation, and it becomes clear that we only have two options at that point, which would be to either remove the whole tooth uh, in order to address the bacteria that has found its way into the, uh, into the root canal space, which is normally sterile, or do root canal therapy, which entails removal of the bacteria from inside the root canal and sealing that space closed so it doesn't become recontaminated. So we're talking about the latter, which is an attempt to save the tooth through doing root canal therapy. And when it comes to that, it's very important to understand that the clear-cut answer is proper rubber dam isolation. Now, I understand that in many places around the world, uh, people are still used to be doing endodontic therapy um, the way it had been done many, many years ago without proper isolation with a rubber dam. And in fact, some of the newer techniques for isolation, such as the use of isolite or various forms of gadgets and devices, have given people a false sense of security that they can do the same isolation they do for their regular restorative work to do endodontic therapy. Let me just tell you right off the bat that that is not the case. Rubber dam isolation, and not just mere rubber dam isolation, but fluid tight rubber dam isolation, is really the only proper way to have control of the microbial contamination that can happen during endodontic therapy. So, to some extent, the basic rubber dam isolation entails uh, placing a rubber dam a clamp and a rubber dam around a tooth or multiple teeth, and then making sure that you have the tongue and the saliva out of the way. I also use some of these devices, including this um, particular mouth prop by Common Sense Dental, so that you can have your patients be able to open and rest while having a rubber dam on. It's important to communicate with your patients the importance of having a rubber dam on. I sometimes hear from restorative dentists in workshops that their patients don't allow them to use the rubber dam, or they don't like a rubber dam. It is really a very poor excuse because it's akin to me saying that I'd like to have some kidney surgery done. However, I'm, told, I'm telling my physician that I don't like to have surgical uh, prep in the operating room, and I like my surgeon not to wear gloves. It just doesn't work. It's very important for us as 
clinicians and physicians of the mouth to properly communicate with our patients the options that they have and the options they don't have. And I can tell you that if you're doing endodontic therapy without a rubber dam, you are committing negligence and therefore this is not something that is optional. It has to be applied. It's been established clearly, at least in the USA. Uh, and the reason why it is um, a standard of care isn't just so that the patients don't swallow their files. If there were ways that you could tie flosses at the end of every file and prevent that from happening, that would still not be an option. The main reason, as I mentioned, is because it allows you to have microbial control, not just from saliva, but also from curricular fluid, as well as from uh, the patient's own breath. So make sure that you apply that. I also use a um, um, I use some eye protection as well as uh, we oftentimes use these noise canceling headsets that are connected and patients can also view some kind of a, a movie or something or listen to music while we're having the work done. So when it comes to rubber dam isolation, there's also a misunderstanding that you're not just going through the motions of placing a rubber dam, but rather the goal of the rubber dam isolation is having a fluid tight seal. Oftentimes, the cause of endodontic disease is an interproximal cavity decay or large restoration with, is, which is leaking. And therefore, you end up having this type of a um, uh, situation in which you remove the decay and the restoration, and now you have a huge cavity on the mesial or the distal of the tooth, and you are having a lack of uh, control or a lack of seal, for a better word, of either fluids, saliva, blood, and also crevicular fluid pouring into the area after you do your pulpotomy. It's very important at this point to complete your isolation. As restorative dentists, you oftentimes have the option of removing the entire decay and then following that up by placing a glassionomer, you know, Ketax Silver or a, um, a quick core in place and then reaccessing through that in order to have a good 360 degree isolation. As an endodontist, I oftentimes don't end up having, don't have the opportunity to do that because the restorative dentists want to place their core themselves. And in those situations, I use a product called Opal Dam by Ultradent, which is a form of an unfilled resin that uh, you use uh, and cure in, you know, you place into the area and then you cure it. And that gives you a pretty good isolation. So here it is the same tooth after the application of Opal Dam. And you can see that now we have sealed the crevicular fluid seepage from around the tooth. And now we can proceed to do our pulpotomy and have fairly good isolation throughout the procedure as we move forward. So this is the same case after it's completed. And you can see that we have now, we've managed to keep the isolation adequate throughout the length of the procedure. And that's really the key. Is, as you can see here in this case, the goal isn't to just place a rubber dam, but rather have uh, it fully isolated to the extent that the seal is fluid tight. And one of the ways I check my fluid tight seal is by submerging the tooth in full strength hypochlorite after isolation, which does two things. Number one, it also sterilizes the rubber dam field itself uh, and the field that I've worked on because by that point, usually I've already removed the decay. So there is probably a smear of bacteria from decay and the aerosol that is sprayed all over the rubber dam so that same, the space has to be decontaminated as well following carries removal. So in this example, I'm putting this on at the beginning of the procedure because I've already tested for the uh, uh, for anesthesia, proper anesthesia, and there's no more decay to remove. But oftentimes what I recommend is to have a primary isolation using just the rubber dam and the clamp, and then access through the tooth, remove all the decay, and then at that point, move on to create your secondary isolation, which would be fluid tight. So it's important to uh, consider that because sometimes you may have to remove the rubber dam and uh, you know for various reasons and you don't want to have your secondary isolation too early on. 
uh, and um, this would be a good way to go about it. So this helps prevent contamination. And what contamination, as far as endodontic therapy is, is the seepage of microbial sources from the patient's own saliva, breath, and uh, skin, and so on, into the field. Cross-contamination, on the other hand, is microbial sources that are foreign to the patient that come from, you know, from, um, from a lack of proper sterilization that may come from a different patient, from the uh, assistant, uh, or from yourself. And here, I'm not necessarily talking about infectious diseases, things such as hepatitis and HIV, that you clearly are trying to, um, to safeguard against by having proper autoclaving and other forms of isolation. I'm talking about bacteria that do not cause any other kind of a disease in a patient that you can even get from a handshake. But if finding themselves inside the root canal could be a source of potential failure down the line. So things such as touching your gloves uh, in the areas, you know, before you put them on creates the same biofilm that exists on your skin could get on the external surface of the gloves. You can end up uh, having, you know, during the radiographic uh, um, sessions during the procedure when you're taking radiographs, you may want to move the patient around and by holding the patient on their skin with your gloves, you end up having a smear of the patient's uh, biofilm again on, on their biome on your gloves. All of these sources are fairly innocuous under normal situations. However, uh, any of these types of bacteria could potentially end up in the root canal, which could then potentially act as an antigen and reduce your uh, overall success rate for the procedure. Remember that the main goal of endodontic therapy is to remove all the germs from the root canal system and not add more. And as long as you keep this basic concept in mind, you'll realize that you will do well. Just a quick little uh, case to, uh, to kind of share with you. We can see here we have a central incisor, a maxillary left central incisor that has a large carious lesion. There are large um, class three composite restorations. Oftentimes in these old composite restorations, there is leakage and it's micro leakage. So the tooth looks okay, but the, this leakage creates a pulpal um, disease and eventual necrosis. And in this particular case, you can see that the patient also has a fairly large sinus tract in this tooth, and is another angle of it. And uh, so, you know, here you could do individual tooth isolation, but I just wanted to also show you a different form of isolation, which is fairly quick by connecting two or three large holes on your rubber dam and just pulling it over from lateral to lateral, and you'll end up with this form of primary isolation. This would be also helpful in cases in which you may have a tooth that is um, not properly aligned, and you'd like to have a look at the adjacent teeth for proper access preparation. And this gives you a little better sense of uh, direction and alignment by seeing multiple teeth versus one. And by just connecting a few of these uh, holes together, it's a little bit faster than individually um, isolating the teeth. And also, it gives you a chance to take a look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the gingiva. However, as we know already, after your preparation and access to these uh, teeth, you do need to get your opal dam out and isolate this properly by uh, covering the gingiva and the crevicular fluid. So that's important to keep that in mind too. And here's that same tooth after the access preparation. And you know the isolation showed us a good way of preventing contamination. And then we need to decontaminate the tooth and that comes with proper um, you know, apical diameter getting to a large enough size so that you can mechanically clean the root surfaces internally by having a file rub against them so that you could remove the biofilm. So a large apical preparation as well as proper irrigation using the proper irrigant. In this case, I'm using sodium hypochlorite, full strength. However, I'm using it with negative pressure. Therefore, I can run a safe uh, volume of this material all the way down to the apex. And that's basically the tooth after the fill and the uh, 
putting of the cavity in there, and the final uh, radiograph that shows adequate uh, apical preparation and fill, and the patient did very well. But I also wanted to talk about the, the need to replace these composite, uh, uh, composite restorations in such patients as opposed to merely fill the access hole. You have to understand that these cases failed primarily due to microleakage. So if you leave the old restoration in place, you're really not addressing the source of bacteria and you will get coronal leakage and down the line you will have potential failure. So I hope um, that you understand what I was trying to, uh, to, to, to show in this little tutorial is to say that a concept of success is microbial control. Uh, and now, unfortunately, we all in the field get excited about new files and new instruments and new techniques and new obturation materials, but the one common denominator, no matter what material technique or system you're using, is microbial control. And that is the part that oftentimes uh, it doesn't get mentioned enough because that is the one thing that you can immediately do and increase your success rate no matter what technique you use. We will touch base on those other areas, such as proper irrigation and so on, in other tutorials. But in this tutorial, I wanted to say that if you're interested in having an increase in your success rate very easily, all you need to do is you have to pay attention and heed the aseptic protocol that you use clinically to prevent contamination of the root canal and co cross-contamination of that same space uh, on your patients. I'm sure they will benefit and are very appreciative uh, of your efforts in, uh, in doing so. For Reworld Endo, I'm Ali Nisse, and I hope you found this information helpful.